Masechet Yom Mestaf Kofiud Vez concludes the thirteenth part of the Masechta and begins the fourteenth. So the end of the thirteenth is discussing our last Mishnah, where we had seen two situations in which a woman is trying to figure out how to get out of a yibum scenario. In the first one, she says, "We did yibum, but he never did a bia, and therefore I require a chalitza still." If she believed or not. And the second one is where she made a neder against the yavam. Can she stick with that neder or not? So the Gemara first analyzes the first case. There we had seen that the Mishnah had. Given a psak that within 30 days of him taking her into the household, there is a possibility that he didn't do the bia yet. After 30 days, it's not possible. And therefore, we um, work out the halacha based on that. Within 30 days, we can say that she's trusted to say that a bia wasn't done and she requires chalitza. After 30 days, a bia was certainly done. We can't force him to give her a chalitza. She, however, does have to stick to her own word. So the Gemara focuses on the idea that a man definitely will do a B after 30 days, not uh, withhold himself longer than 30 days. The Gemara says this seems to be the opinion of Rabbi Meir, and Rabbi Yaisi seems to disagree. Where do you see that? So they're discussing a different situation, not a situation of Yibum, but you have a man who marries a regular wife, and then he comes up with the claim she wasn't a basula. I found that she was not a basula, and now he wants to send her away without a ksuba. He wants to say that this marriage was a mistake. I thought she was a basula. I thought she was a virgin, but she isn't. Now, up until what point can he claim that? How deep into the marriage is he allowed to say, oh, when I first did the BOA back when, it wasn't a basula. So Rabbi Mayer says that he's got to be that um, the B was done now, and he's saying, I just did my first beer. And he's only trusted to say that he only did his first beer within 30 days. After 30 days, he can't say, oh, I just did the beer now. I didn't do anything up until now. Therefore, it, the assumption is that he got angry with her, and he's looking to send her away with Atixuba, and he's making up an excuse. So that fits perfectly with our Mishnah. Up to 30 days, he's trusted to say, I didn't do the beer yet. After that, he's not. Now, Rebbeisi says differently. Rebbeisi says, it depends if they did Yichud or not. If they did Yichud, then he's got to make his claim right away. He, he doesn't have 30 days to say, I didn't do the beer yet. We assume the beer was done right away. If they did not do Yichud, okay, they didn't do Yichud. They were never together, so they never had an opportunity. So then he can make the claim as long as he wants. So here we see that Rebbeisi says, there is no 30 days in which we assume that it's possible that it didn't do the beer yet. So the Gemara says that that does that mean that Rabbi Yossi doesn't fit in our Mishnah? So Gemara says no, Rabbi Yossi could fit in our Mishnah. In our Mishnah, it's a Yavam and Yavama. They are shy from each other. They don't have a relationship. They were never Arusos. They were never engaged. They didn't have a courtship period at all. They were just kind of thrown together. They were shy. It could be that they waited up to 30 days. He said his Allah in the case of a regular Aris and Arusa, there you wouldn't assume that there was a 30 day window. All right, now the Gemara has a kasha. We said in our Mishnah that um, when it's within 30 days, so we trust the woman who says the beer was not done yet, and therefore we force him to do chalitza. Why do we force him to do chalitza? If we trust her that no yibum was done yet, so let him have the option of doing yibum now. Let him have the option of taking her into the household and doing a yibum with a beer as it's supposed to be. So the Gemara answers, Rav says, she already has a debt. She has a divorce document from him. And now they're coming to court and she's saying, the get's not enough because I never was married to him. I'm still a Yavama and I need a Chalitza. But he can't do Yibam after he gave her a get because that's the beginning of a divorce that ruins, that makes her puzzle to him. They can't do uh, Yibam after that. So the Gemara says it can't be that she has a get already because I'll show you there's a Brisa that repeats the Mishnah and extends it and goes further. And one of the cases it says that she already has a get. So And then it gives the same stock afterwards. It says she requires a get. It doesn't say she has a get. It says she requires a get. If you're telling me she already has a get, how could the Brysa have one of its cases being that she still requires a get? You just said she already has one. That's Gemara's cash. So, so let's see the Brysa. So the Brysa begins with the same two cases which we had in our Mishnah. Yavamo says within 30 days, I didn't get a Bia. He doesn't matter what he says. We believe her and we force him to do chalitas. That's the same as our Mishnah. That's the case we asked on. Now the Brysa talks about what happens if it's after 30 days. So it's after 30 days. If she says, I didn't get a Bia, so then we ask him to do chalitza because she's kind of stuck. She can't get remarried. There's a rule that says if she claims that she's still a Yavamo, she can't go marry someone else. 
um, he is free. He could say, no, I did a via. I gave her a get. There's no problem. So he doesn't have to give her chalitza. She has to get chalitza. We ask him, we can't force him, but we ask him, please give her a chalitza. Now, if it's reversed, if he says, I did not do a bia, and she says she did get a bia. Now, again, we assume that the bia did happen. It doesn't matter who's the one who says that it happened. If Adam says that it happened, we assume that it happened. And here, the woman doesn't have a shavi anafshay, and therefore, there's no requirement to give a chalitza. No one needs a chalitza. She says she's enough to get a get, and we believe that the truth is that it's enough to give a get, so she gets a get. Um, next mission says, if you had it the first way, that she said, I didn't get a Bia, and he says, I did a Bia, and then he changed his mind and said, no, I didn't do a Bia. So here he requires, she requires a get and a Chalitza. Again, it's after 30 days, so we assume the Bia was done and Chalitza is required, uh, and therefore a get is required. And she's saying that I didn't get, so she has a Shavya Nafshe, so Chalitza is required. He changed his mind, so he'll give her a Chalitza. But we still assume that he did do the Bia, even though he changed his mind and said no, and therefore will require him to give the get. Now, so here we have our Kasha. Again, we're seeing that the case is that, she's, that she already has a get. Um, we're seeing, that is, that if you are saying she already has a get, it doesn't make sense that the Mishnah, that this Bryce has said in the last two cases that he has to give her a get. Why does she have to give her a get if she already has one? Samara gives two answers. The first answer is Rabbi Ami. He says, no, when we said that she requires a get, we don't mean he has to give her a new get now. She already has a get. We just mean, along with her get, she has to get a chalitza. Rashi asks, um, how could you give a psak that she needs to give a get if she already has a get? Rashi answers. But what the Gemara's explanation is that she, along with the get that she already has, she requires chalitza. That's the chiddush here. The Gemara's second answer is Rav Ashi. Rav Ashi says, when we said she has a get, we didn't mean she has a get that divorces her from a marriage. We meant she has a get that's supposed to break her yibum. It's supposed to break her zika. There is a derabanon concept of get for a zika, which doesn't finish the job, but it does create a psal. So the get that we're saying she has, and the reason she can't do yibum, is because she has a get for zika. The Mishnah here is saying she needs a get for marriage, because we assume that after 30 days she was married. And therefore the two gets we're saying are two different ones, and there is no uh, contradiction at all. All right, before the Gemara moves on to the next part of the Mishnah, the Gemara has another case here. The Gemara says there are two people who came, a man and a woman came, to break their uh, Yibam marriage, and they both said that they didn't do a Bia, but it was after 30 days, so they came in front of Rava. Rava said, do Chalitza, and that's it. The fight's over. You don't have to argue anymore. Do Chalitza is all you require. You both agree that you didn't do uh, Bia, and therefore you don't require a get. So Gemara says that was Rava's um, Psak, but whoever was asked by Rav Shiravia that our Brysa just said that even if they both agree, you still require a get. So, because we assume that the beer was done after 30 days. So, Rav said, okay, if you have a Brysa, you have a Brysa. Fine. So, that's what you do. I think was another question here was asked to Rav Nachman from his son, Ahon. Ahon said, what's the halacha of the tsara? The tsar, when this Yibum or non Yibum, when this, when the Yavam took the Yavam into his house, the Tsara went free. She went and she married the Shok. She assumed Yibum happened. Now we're coming back and we're saying, no, you have to give Chalitza. We possibly, we forced the guy to do Chalitza. Um, either we force him or we ask him, depending who said what, depending how long it is. What is, does that mess up the Tsara now? Because she also requires a Chalitza if there was no Yibum that was really performed all along. So, what's the halacha of the tsar? So, the verse says, Renachman answered him, no, the tsar is no problem. It's just because we're going to force or ask the husband to do a chalitza now, that's because of what they said. It's all shavi anashe. It's all based on what they said. The tsar has no problem. She could assume that everything's all right, and uh, she doesn't need to, she doesn't require anything. Her life doesn't change based on this. All right, now the one goes to the next part of the Mishnah, where we had said that if a woman takes a neder, she's not going to have hana from her yavam, 
So it depends if her husband was alive at the time she made the nether or not. If the husband was alive, she wasn't trying to get out of Yibam, we assume, and therefore we force the Yibam to do Chalitza. If the husband was dead already, she's trying to work her way out of the Chalitza, then we ask the Yibam, well, she's trying to work her way out of the Yibam, that is, we ask the Yibam to please the Chalitza. So the Gemara quotes the mission which talks about general situations in which a woman is trying to get out of her marriage, or seems to be trying to get out of her marriage, and it brings three types of things a woman could say which would offer her on her husband, and whether or not we believe her, or do we assume she's just making it up and trying to get out of marriage. these three things. The first one was where she said, I'm a, I was a uh, Nisanis. She's a, an Aishas Kohen. She's married to a Kohen. She says she was raped by somebody. And if that happens to a Kohen's wife, he, she's also to her husband. So we believed her and she got to go free. He had to give her again. The second was where she says, Hashemayim be'ni levenach, where she says, heavens will testify you're not treating me right. That is in their private, intimate life. He's not fulfilling his obligations to her. Of course, we couldn't know that, but that's what she says. So we believed her, and we said that she's allowed to go free. And the third one is where she made a Shavuah that I'm also, I'm not going to have enough from all the Jews, from all Jewish men out there, I'm not going to have any enough. Now, had she said, I'm not going to have enough from you, we would assume she's just trying to ask herself on her husband and trying to get out of the marriage. However, she said, all Jewish men, why'd she do that? Obviously, she's not trying to just get out of the marriage. She really has a problem. She cannot bear the intimate experience it must be painful for her and therefore we allow her to go free and in all these she gets her ksuba because uh, there's nothing she's doing wrong so Zimbabwe, then we changed and uh and we said this is not correct because we saw that what the woman was doing was she was trying to uh, take her ksuba go somewhere else where they didn't know about the nether that she made and go marry someone else so therefore we changed the reaction to all this. As far as the Cohen's wife who said that I was raped, we said, you have to prove it. We don't believe you. As far as the one who said, he's not treating me right. So we talked to the guy, we say, listen, treat your wife right. Um, and as far as where she made a nether that she's us are all Jews. So he does have Faris Nadarim on his part. The fact that she's us to him, the husband, he says, I may fear that nether. You're not us to me. You are us to all Jews, but you're us to them anyway, because you're my wife. So the Gemara's question is, what about Yibam? What if in that case, what if then the husband dies and she falls to Yibam? Is she now also to her Yavam? Because she said she's also to all Jews and nobody was made for that. Nobody could be made for that. It's not in the husband's jurisdiction and the Yavam can't wake up who knows how much later and say, I'm willing to be made for that. So the question is, though, did she have in mind her Yavam or not? She was trying to Aser all other men. She wanted to make it clear that she's not going to marry somebody else. Now, that was her intention. Did she include her Yavam? Her Yavam was, at the time her husband was alive, her Yavam was her, her husband's brother. She was also to him anyway. So she probably didn't have him in mind to show that she's going to assert herself on him. She never dawned on her that she might end up one day having to marry him. She was also, he was already asked to her at the time. Do we say that or do we say, no, all men means all men. So that's the Gemara's question. So the Gemara quotes a machlokis as to what the answer is. Rav says, We assume she did not think about the Yavim. She didn't consider the possibility of falling to Yibam. And therefore the Yavim is excluded from the Nether. That's not what she had in mind. Shmuel says, No, she does. She is aware that there's such a thing as Yavim in the world. And therefore she had her Yavim in mind as well. Says the Gemara, Abai says it's logical. You can prove from her Mishnah that Rav's right, that she doesn't have in mind that uh, she wants to ask her. She's not thinking about the possibility of Yibam while her husband's alive. Where do you see that? Because the Mishnah says if she makes a nether to ask herself on her husband directly. This is talking about where she directly said she's also on this guy. So if, um, or even if she said she's also on everyone. So if the husband was alive, then we say that uh, we force the, the Yavam to free her because she wasn't trying to get out of it. Now, that fits according to Rav, because Rav said that she's not thinking about Yibum. She's not thinking about that possibility. If she made the nether, she really meant it. It was honest. She wasn't trying to work her way out of it. If Shmuel would be right that she did think about the possibility of Yibum, so then even if her husband was alive at the time that she made the nether in the Mishnah, she should, we should say, hey, she was trying to get out of this, and we should just ask him to give her Chalitza, not force him, just like we only ask him and don't force him in the case where her husband was already dead, and she knows she's falling to Yibum. So the Gemara says, no, you can't prove anything from our Mishnah. Our Mishnah was talking about where she had sons. 
That's why, in the case of the Mishnah, you assume she wasn't thinking about the Yavam. That she should think, I have, that I have kids, but my kids might die, and then my husband will die, and then he died without kids. You have two, you have two steps that have to, two unlikely things that have to happen before she'll fall to Yibam. That's why she didn't consider it. However, I'm talking about, or our case is, and Shmuel will say, I was referring to, where there are no sons. And therefore, uh, the possibility is not so remote. All it takes is for her husband to die now and she'll fall to Yibam, and therefore she does think of it. Now, the Gemara has a problem with this. The Gemara says it can't be that the case of Mishnah is talking about where there are sons, because when a Mishnah tries to come up with a case where we um, do not force the husband, to, the, the, we do not force the Yavim to do Chalitza, because we assume she wasn't trying to get out of it. Why do we have to go to a case where the husband was already dead and she's already fallen to Yibam? Go a step beyond that. Go to the case that Shmuel said. Go to the case where she is, where she's married, and she has no kids. And Shmuel says, there we, she thinks of it, and therefore we would only ask him. We wouldn't force him. But Amisha doesn't say that case. Amisha says, oh, you want to know what's the case in which we ask him because we assume she's trying to get out of it? That's where her husband's already dead. That shows that Shmuel's case is not true. Okay, therefore, the Gemara concludes, it's a proof to rabbi. So that's the end of the 13th parak. Now we get to the 14th parak. It's a short Perik, but it has all the Mishnayis up front in the beginning, so we have a very lengthy Mishnah here, and it talks about a marriage between a Pikeach, a Cheresh, a Shota, and any combinations of the three. And the Mishnah is going to go through if what is the status of the marriage of a Cheresh to a Pikeach or another Cheresh's, or a Cheresh's, or a Shota. Shota is a person who's considered to be insane. Chereshes is a deaf mute. Chereshes or a cheresh have some das, not complete das, and they can't speak, which is a problem in both a yibum, which is a problem in a chalitza, and in a gerishin and a kedushin. You have to communicate to do all these things. So it's going to go through many different cases and how they combine for the halacha. By way of introduction, let's get the principles down straight in advance. Generally, the rule is as follows. A cheresh has a marriage de Rabbanon. He can do uh, marriage de Rabbanon. It's given certain strength. And whatever strength of his marriage is, he could break it. However, if there is a marriage de Raisa, then a cheresh cannot break the marriage de Raisa because he can't do a full-fledged divorce. He can't speak. He has to do a nonverbal divorce. However, as far as a chareshes goes, she can get divorced because she doesn't have to do anything. A woman can get divorced bal karcha. She doesn't have to be involved. And as far as a shota, so the, there is no marriage to on a shota. And you also can't divorce a shota because then she'll end up wandering around being hefker. And then we'll also have to talk about yibum. And of course, the zika of a chareshes, the zika of a cheresh or a chareshes is only partial. It's only a partial zika. It leaves room for another marriage or zika to take effect and a cheresh and uh cheresh cannot do chalitza chalitza requires speaking cannot be done non-verbally so let's begin the mission it goes through the cases we begin with the easy one first you have a marriage between a cheresh and a pikeach or a chereshes and a pikachas so the halacha is that they have a Dirabon in marriage, they can stay married, they can get divorced, they can do whatever they want. They can stay married because they were given a Rabbanon right. They can get divorced because just like they got married non-verbally, so it's only a Dirabon marriage, they can also do the divorce in the same way. How she goes in is how she goes out. If she had a non-verbal marriage, they can have a non-verbal divorce. This is referring to, of course, where, she, where whoever was a Cheresh was that way from the beginning. Now, what happens if you have a pikeach, who is a full-fledged uh, individual, who marries a pikachas, both full flesh, and then she becomes a chareshes? So he can divorce her because she can get divorced bal karcha. The fact that she's a chareshes does not a problem. She doesn't have to be involved. She can get divorced against her will. If she became a shota, he should not divorce her. There are banan. We don't want her being hefker. Now, if he's the one who became a cheresh, or he became a shota, then you can't get out of this, because this was a full-fledged daraisa marriage, they were pekech and pekachas at the time that the marriage began, he can no longer do 
a gerish in the Raisa. He has to speak and say Harry is a gitech. To do that non-verbally doesn't work if the marriage itself originally was strong. So the, the Mishnah quotes Rabbi Yechelen ben Nuri, who says, why is there a difference between whether he became the Cheresh or she became the And the answer is, when she became the Cheresh, the Mishnah explains, she can get divorced by al doesn't have to be involved, even if she has no das involved. He, however, cannot do a Raisa marriage because he cannot speak. Now, the Gemara, the Mishnah quotes of Yechna ben Gudgida, who testified that there was a situation where there was a Chareshes who was married by her father when she was a Katana. She was, at the time of the marriage, she was a Chareshes. However, that's a derisive marriage anyway, because her father was Makabal Kedushin for her. She doesn't have to be involved in that. And she was able to get divorced with a get, regular get. Her husband was a Bikeach. And there, it's a derisive marriage. And uh, Daraisa divorce, and therefore that's just like the case of the Pikachas, who was divorced by her Pikeach husband, even though she became a Chareshes. So here, this girl grew up, but she had to be a couple of her own get, and she was a Chareshes, so that counts exactly the same way. All right, now we're going to get into you. So what happens if you have two brothers? So the Mishnah first discusses all combinations where you have two brothers married to two sisters, and therefore when one of them falls to, when one of the brothers dies, uh, his wife falls to Yibam to an Achos Ishto situation. She's falling to Yibam to her sister's husband, and there's an Achos Ishto Iser. So, if anyone, in, if the two brothers or the two wives are Cheresh's or Cheresh's, irrespective of what the other ones are, whether they're both Cheresh, or four of them are Cheresh, or one is Cheresh, one is Pikeach, both are Pikachim, doesn't matter if both husbands are Cheresh or if both wives are Cheresh's, then this marriage is only a Dirabanan marriage. There was it was a non-verbal marriage, and they're on equal footing. The Zika of the one who's falling to Yibam is not stronger than the marriage. Since the marriage creates an Iser Ashes, an Iser Achos Isha, the Zika is broken and she goes free without having to have anything. It's like an error falling to Yibam. Now, if they were not sisters, so you have a regular woman falling to Yibam, either from a Derabanan situation or a Derisa situation. Um, well, if one of them was a Cheresh or Cheresh for shorts, Derabanan, so he can um, marry her. He cannot do Chalitza. Cheresh and Cheresh can't do Chalitza. Chalitza requires speaking. Once they're married, then he can give the get um that would work since the original marriage was only a cherish marriage. The get can be a cherish get. However, cherish chalitza cannot be done even on a cherish marriage, according to this Mishnah thus far. Now the Mishnah goes on to cases where they were uneven. You had one of the brothers was a cherish or one of the sisters was a cherish. Again, we're talking about two brothers married to two sisters. So the first case is where one of the brothers was a cherish, the other one was a pikeach, but both sisters were in pikeach. So here the halacha is as follows. If the pikeach brother is the one who's alive, it's the cherish that died. So now you have he is a pikeach married to a pikachas and a yibum falling to him to yibum is a pikachas. Since everyone involved here is a pikeach, uh, it's a regular achos ishto. And she goes free as Achos Ishto. There is no Yibam required. If, however, the husband, the brother who is a Pikech, is the one who dies, and now you have the woman who is falling to Yibam to a Cheresh, now you have a problem. And the reason is, is that his own marriage here is only a partial marriage. He is a Cheresh, married to a Pikachas. That's a partial marriage. He has a regular Pikachas falling to him to Yibam. That's a Zika de Raisa. That Zika de Raisa breaks his own marriage, his own marriage is only Dirabanan, and the Zika is Deraisa, his wife is now an Achos Zikukaso, and he must set her free. How could he do that? So he could give her a get, even though he's a Cheresh, that's fine, because his original marriage is only Dirabanan, because he was a Cheresh, so he can set her free as a Cheresh. What could he do with his Yivama? Nothing. He is a Cheresh, he can't do Chalitza, and she's stuck, she can't get out of this. She's not freed because of uh, Achos Ishto, because the marriage of the uh, of the Yavam to his wife was only Dirabanan. Now, what happens next case if both brothers were Pikchim, but one of the sisters, one of the wives, was a Chareshes? 
So here it's as follows. If it's the Charesh is falling to Yibam, that is her husband is the one who died and she's falling to Yibam, then the marriage uh, between the Yavam and his wife is a regular derisive marriage. The woman falling to him to Yibam is an Achos Ishto and she goes free with no issues. If, however, the Pikachas is falling to Yibam, now the marriage that she's falling into of her Yavam and his wife is only a Darabonon marriage. She has a Darais of Zika that messes up that marriage. She's again, the wife is now an Achos Kukoso and therefore also to her husband. So he has to set her free. How could he do that? Well, since um, he is a Pikeach and she is a Chareshes, so he can. Give her a get, that's fine. She got married as a Chareshes, she can get divorced as a Chareshes. Uh, the Yavama, though, can get a regular Chalitza. She's a Pikachas, he's a Pikach. They can do a regular Chalitza without an issue. Now the mission says, what happens if both had one pair? That in both in pairs, one was a Pikach, one was a Chareshes. So you had a two brothers, one was a Chareshes, one was a Pikach, married to two sisters, one of which was a Chareshes, one of which was a Pikachas. The Chareshes is married to Chareshes, and the Pikach is married to the Pikachas. So the same halachas play out here as we had in our first case um, of the two sisters. That is, if the uh, Pikachas is the one who is falling to Yibam to the Cheresh, so the marriage of the Cheresh to the Chereshes is only Dirabanon. The Zika of the Pekachas is Deraisa because her original marriage was to a Pekach. And therefore that Zika breaks up the marriage. So he has to set them both free. What could he do? Well, the original marriage was a Dirabanon marriage. So he can give his wife, the Chereshes, a Dirabanon divorce. He can give her a non-verbal divorce. So she, she gets a get. However, the uh, Pekachas is him to Yibam can't get Chalitza. A Cheresh can't do Chalitza. If it's the other way, the Chareshes is falling to Yibam, to the Bikach and the Bikachas, then she is an Ashes, she's an Achosishto, and she goes free without anything. Now, what happens if they're not sisters? The Mishnah goes now through a number of the cases in which they are not sisters. So the first case is both women were Pikachos, and the two brothers, one was a Pikach, one was a Cheresh. So here, if the Cheresh is the one who dies, so then you have a Pikach, you have a Pikachas falling to Yibam to a Pikach who's married to a Pikachas, no problem. She can do Yibam uh, or Chalitza. It's a normal case. If, however, the Pikach is the one who dies, and now you have the Pikachas falling to Yibam to a Cheresh who's married to a Pikachas. So because he's a Cheresh, he can't do Chalitza, he has to do Yibum, and he cannot give her a get either, because the original marriage was a Doiraisa marriage. She was originally married Pikach to Pikachas. That's the Zika that was created, that's the Yibum that happened, and his Cheresh get is not going to be enough to break that up. So he has to do Yibum, he cannot divorce her. Next, what if one of the two women was a Cheresh's? Both brothers are Pikchos, are Pikchim. So here, again, if the husband of the uh, Pikachas is the one who dies, and therefore you have a Pikachas falling to Yibam to a Pikeach, who's married to a Chareshe, so it doesn't matter who he's married to, they're not sisters, you have a regular Pikachas falling to Yibam to a Pikeach, he can do Yibam or Chalitza. If, however, the Chareshe is the one who's falling to Yibam, so he cannot do Chalitza, Chalitza doesn't work on a Chareshe, she has to speak, he has to do uh, Yibum. Once he marries her, he can give her a get. He's a Pikeach, and a get can be given Balkarcha to a Chereshes. Now, what if both pairs, one brother was a Cheresh, and one of the women was a Chereshes? The Cheresh is married to the Chereshes, but there's a brother who's a Pikeach married to Pikachas. So what happens now? So if the Pikachas is the one who's falling to Yibum, so she's falling to a Cheresh, Cheresh cannot do Chalitza, and the Cheresh cannot do a get here because the original marriage was a Deraisa. So he has to do Yibam and cannot send her away at all. If the Cheresh is the one who's falling to Yibam to the Pikeach, so he can't do Chalitza, he has to do Yibam. However, he can give a get because he's a Pikeach and she is a Cheresh is allowed to receive a get because it's Bakarcha. And therefore, he can choose to give her a get afterwards if he wants. That's the end of the Mishnah. Now the Gemara comments on why is it that we said that a Shota does not have a Dirabanan marriage. There is no such concept. However, a 
Chereshes and a Cheresh have a Dirabanan marriage. So the Gemara says, Gemara asks, remember, Chama asks, what's the difference between the two? So the Gemara first proves that it's true. The Gemara brings a price that says, a Shota and a Katan who got married, if they married women and they died, their wives are Potter from Yibam and Chalitza because there's no marriage at all. Their marriage had no validity. However, Cheresh and Cheresh's they had a, they do have a Zika. So the Gemara answers that a Cheresh and a Cheresh's can get along with each other, and a Cheresh and a Cheresh's can get along with a Pikeach. Therefore, since the marriage can exist, the Rabbana made a Tekana that such a marriage should exist. However, a Shota and a, sho, a Shota and a Shota cannot get along with each other or with anyone else, and therefore, you don't make a person live in a basket together with a snake. The Rabbana didn't create a situation, they didn't provide for a marriage that can't last. The Gemara says, but what about a katan? Why did we say that? Why weren't we metakinating their abundant marriage for him? So the Gemara says there was no reason to. He's going to grow up, and then he can do regular marriage when he's older. Why should we do one for him when he's a uh, katan? So the Gemara says, well, how come a katana does have a marriage to abundant? Even if she's a yisoma, there's a concept. So the Gemara says there, we were afraid there was going to be a minig hefker. Katana, left on, alone, without a father, without a husband, gets into trouble. So the Gemara says, well then, a Katana has a concept of mian, she can just walk out of this Darbonon a marriage. How come a Chareshes doesn't have a concept of mian if she's only married me Darbonon? So the Gemara says, because nobody's going to marry a Chareshes if she can do mian the rest of her life. There is no limit to the mian stage, she's going to be a Chareshes forever. It didn't provide for me in forever. Katana, who is not a forever situation, she's going to grow up at some point. They allowed that to happen, to, there to be a mian, because people will still marry her, knowing that the mian period 